morning, everyone. I'm going to call the meeting to order for our workshop of the Del Mar College Board of Regents at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, February 1st. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm going to call roll for a quorum. Mr. Garza? Here. Ms. Averett? Here. Ms. Hutchison? Here. Dr. Turner? Here. Mr. Kelly? Here. Dr. Villarreal? Here. Thank you all. We have a quorum and can conduct business. We're going to have our, a moment of silence today in honor of the um, family of Dr. Nikodami, who has lost uh, several uh, fa two family members very close to him in the past week. And we want to send our best wishes to Dr. Adami and his family um, and to all of our uh, Del Mar family who are facing challenges uh, this week. Thank you. Mr. Garza, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Thank you. Would you please join us in reading the Del Mar College vision statement? Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Thank you. Del Mar College is streaming live audio and video from this official Board of Regents meeting on the college's website in real time with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. We now have the opportunity for general public comment. Is there anyone here to provide general public comment for items not on the agenda? Not seeing anyone, we will uh, move on. Uh, we have two items of business for our workshop today. We are going to be uh, hearing some detailed uh, work on the start of our redistricting process. Uh, the bis bicentennial, is that the right word? Decentennial, whatever. Mr. Caputo will tell us about that in a minute. And then also every 10-year process. And then uh, also our, our board annual uh, ethics update. Uh, as a note, I did not do, I did not call his name during a roll call. I apologize. Regent Bennett is participating remotely with us um, and is going to keep his audio and video available for us to comply with Open Meetings Act. Uh, but Regent Bennett is in attendance as well via Teams. So with that, we're going to start our uh, workshop process with Mr. Augie Rivera, who will introduce uh, our team working on redistricting. Thank you very much, Regent Scott, and good morning, Regents. Uh, today we have uh, the next step in the redistricting process that you kicked off last December. Uh, you were pre presented with an initial assessment by Mr. David Mendes uh, with the Bickerstaff firm in Austin who explained to you that your districts are out of, out of balance as a result of the population changes uh, in the, over the last 10 years. I think the word that Regent Scott was looking for was decennial. I'm not sure, but uh, I think that's what she, she, she meant to say. Uh, so it's a 10-year process, and, and today you're, you're taking the next step, and we have with us uh, a partner, Mr. Mendes's, Kabi Caputo, who some of you are familiar with. He's also with the Bickerstaff firm in, in Austin. You've been provided in your packet ahead of time uh, with two different proposals. And I just wanted to set out a couple of things. I'm not gonna steal any of Kabi's thunder, but I just wanted to lay it out that you've got plan A and plan B. And he's gonna explain to you how they arrived at those details, but those are proposals. Again, this is an iterative process that will require all of you to provide input and study. At the end of the day, uh, what you wanna do is come up with a What's the word that they use? A proposed illustrative redistricting plan, uh, otherwise known as a map, um, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that you will be able to then put out to the public for additional comment. And what you'll have to do before finally approving any, any new map, uh, you're gonna have to hold a public hearing where the public is allowed the opportunity to do that. But anyway, uh, Mr. Caputo, if I could uh, have you come up. Hopefully this will work. We've got some technology going here uh, where you will be able to provide him with input if you'd like, real time, and, uh, and, and, and 
manipulate or change the map. I also want to point one other thing out. You're not uh, really required or obligated to take any action today. Uh, so, but the agenda item is phrased to where you can, in the event you want to, if something comes up. But this is, again, just presenting you with uh, proposals for input so that Cobby can take it back and continue to work with it. So with that, I present to you, Mr. Caputo. Cobby, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Augie. Well, this is a, a process not many people get to go through uh, because it does happen once every 10 years. So uh, if you're lucky enough to be on a uh, elected body that uses single member districts, uh, at the beginning of a new decade, you get to go through this process. So congratulations. Um, I want to go through just a little bit of background just to uh, get us back into the mode of thinking about this because I think it was a bit ago when David came and spoke to you all. Um, the, the requirements of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, uh, are that a voting district has to be roughly equal in size to all the other voting districts in that jurisdiction. And the courts have defined roughly equal in size to be no more than a 10% deviation from the biggest to the smallest. Um, so what happens is when the census comes out, we pull the data, uh, we overlay it with your geographic boundaries and your single member district boundaries, and we arrive at what's uh, referred to as a ideal district size. Um, just basically you have five districts, we divide the population by five, and so that would be the perfect district. Uh, and for y'all in this last census, it's about 64,000, almost 400, 64,400. Um, then we see what, the bound, what, what is contained within each of the single member districts. And uh, what we found in yours, not unusual, it's the same in almost every jurisdiction we've dealt with this, this time around, uh, you're out of balance by more than 10%. Um, your biggest district is uh, 54, almost 55% too big. Uh, roughly 21,000 people, almost 22,000 people. And your smallest district is about 16% too small, uh, roughly 10,400 people too small. So we have to redistrict your boundaries. And just to be clear, this is something you have to do. If you don't do this, your election system is subject to a constitutional challenge uh, in the federal court system. So the way we approach this after David came and presented to you basically that data, that you're out of balance, you need to redo it, um, we go back and we draw up what we refer to as base plans or illustrative plans, um, proposed plans for you to look at to kind of show you that there's a lot of different ways you can carve the population up. And we do it uh, in a way that balances the districts out. But if you remember, you adopted criteria about the things you're going to focus on in the redistricting. A lot of it is to use you know, natural uh, boundaries, roads and creeks and rivers and the, the ocean. Um, another one of those was to uh, generally use the base districts, or the, the current districts, as the basis for redistricting. So we're not going to just wash the map away and start over. Um, and then the, another criteria uh, that we're supposed to focus on is to um, keep communities of interest together. And I don't know how to do that because I don't live here and I'm not a politician here. So you are the experts on that part of it. So the plan we did was using most of the other criteria where we use natural boundaries, the base level plans, uh, try to make as few changes as necessary to make it work. Um, but what we have done does not reflect the reality of you know life in Corpus Christi that you all know. So. Feel free during this session, and uh, uh, one of our GIS technicians, Cameron, is online, and he's going to share his screen in a minute, I hope. <laughs> um, okay, good. And then uh, you can start telling us, well, I, you shouldn't have moved that block over here. That was stupid. You know, that, that took it out of a, everybody in that neighborhood is all aligned, and you've moved that one into another district. So that's the kind of thing that we really need your input on. Uh, so the, the plans we have, we have a plan A and a plan B, as Augie said. Plan A is just, we just move blocks around to make it work. And the, it balances out very nicely. It's got a very low deviation, uh, around 5%. Um, so it's perfectly fine from a constitutional perspective. Uh, it protects the voting rights of the minorities uh, who live in, uh, in Corpus Christi, uh, Del Mar College districts. Um, so we, we're compliant with the Voting Rights Act, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act on that front. 
Uh, but what we don't know is, did we do something you know, crazy in terms of you know, who supports each of you or the people who, who really vote? Uh, plan B, the one we'll, we'll get to second, is where we, uh, just to show you an example of different ways you could do it, um, was to focus more on the school district boundary lines and to make sure that the school districts as much as possible are in separate districts. Um, so when we get to that plan, you'll see basically uh, Cal Allen is completely within District 3 now. It used to bleed over into District 1. Um, and it's just an example to show you that there's lots of different ways to do this. There's lots of different geographic and geopolitical boundaries you can focus on. Um, so it's really up to you all to decide. And then before we get deep into this, this map action here and the, and the potential redrawing of things, um, we have to use census blocks. So the Census Department comes in and divides the entire United States up into blocks. In town, they're very nice little squares or rectangles. They're basically a city block. Uh, when you get out towards the edges, they become sort of odd-shaped, and sometimes you, you're surprised. You click on a block, and it extends way, way over to you know, other areas that you weren't expecting. Um, so we have some of that in your jurisdiction. I, I've experienced that in every jurisdiction I've, I've dealt with. Um, so we will see that as we go. If you have a, you know, click on a block and it looks like, my goodness, that's just crazy. It's the census. There's not much that can be done about it. So uh, Cameron, if you would uh, pull up plan A, or maybe you've already pulled up plan A. And when you look at the, the data that's coming up, it, there's the map, and then below it is the districts uh, with a lot of the demographic data associated with it. Uh, it gives you the total population and the deviation, so that's uh, the first check. And then it shows you the racial demographics of total population and then the racial demographics of voting age population, which is another element to consider. And so when we move things around, the first thing we're always going to look at is that first table and say, you know, are we still in in uh, alignment with the 10% deviation. And if we're not, you know, maybe we can wait a minute and move some other things around and see how it goes. But uh, if we start making changes and you see that, that percentage going up and the numbers will turn red <laughs> when, the, when the percentages go uh, out of the 10% deviation. Uh, if it gets really high, we may have to say, okay, we're going down a really rough path here. We should probably back up. But just to go through this uh, map, the red lines on the map are your current districts. The colored lines are the things that we've changed. So for instance, in this one, uh, in District 1, it extends down into District 2 a little bit in town. And District 2 correspondingly drops down into 4 and 5, which makes sense because ultimately 4 needs to give up a little bit of population. It's about seven or 4,000 too big. Um, and 5 needs to give up a lot of population. So. Um, basically, every, every move that we have is going to be something to where five is giving up population basically to one, two, or three. So, uh, and then you can kind of see that three had a little bit of a change between it and one uh, down here. Um, and then further up over in the side there, one kind of expanded out into three. So basically three, uh, because one doesn't touch four or five, the ones that have to give up population, we're kind of having to daisy chain it a little bit. So, you know, one moved over into three a little bit, and then three had to pick up even more out of four and five. And so that's, that's what this plan does. Um, it's not a lot of moves, necessarily. Um, and, and I think that demonstrates that, that there's a lot of population in town. There's a lot of density in there. And so moving uh, just a couple of blocks really has a fairly substantial change. And that's where then we need you to tell us, you know, are there different blocks we need to be moving around instead of the ones that we did. And I will open the floor uh, to y'all to react, respond, ask questions, throw things at me. So let's do, we'll do this one plan at a time yes. uh, and see if there's some specific feedback and then toward the end of the discussion we'll discuss uh, preference for potentially one plan over the other. Is that necessary today, or are we going to proceed with two plans for a bit? We can proceed with as many plans as y'all want. I, okay. I've had jurisdictions where there's six or seven, which gets crazy, and I don't recommend that at all. But having you know two two different plans that you're kind of working on, 
gives the community something to react to, um, okay. gives you more more thought, you know, more, more places to think about what, what would be good. And honestly, we could probably figure out a way to merge the two if you wanted to try to figure that out. Okay. And we, but we can do that down the road. That doesn't have to be today. So for specific what feedback. What do you mean by merging? You mean like over, overlaying? Well, you know, like we could take the idea of using school district boundaries like we did in, in, in Plan B, but move different blocks around in town to make it balance out, um, you know. That plan B is totally fluid at this point. Everything is, is you know, in flux until you all are happy with the map. And then the process would be once you're happy with the map, we go out to the public with that. We have a public hearing or two public hearings. Let the public react to it. Maybe we make changes based on that feedback. Maybe we don't. Um, okay. And then we finally get to the point where you adopt a plan. Uh, your drop dead deadline to adopt a plan is probably in July-ish. Right. I'm well, we hopeful wanted, we won't take that long. We were hoping to do it by May, June at the absolute latest. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I think right. it's entirely possible to get it done in, in, in April, but okay. it's up to you all in your community. So who has d are some specific feedback or questions, Mr. Kelly? I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm looking at um, district, that District 3 is my district, um, and I know you inherited this because it's the way the districts are drawn, but yes. Tulosa Midway and Cal Allen are um, population together, isolated from the rest of the city by the industrial area, and therefore fit the criteria of common interests. They go to the same grocery store, they eat at the same restaurants, their children play in the same little league. Um, it's a isolated population in this city, and so I'm wondering why they're divided. If our criteria is to not divide um, uh, populations with similar interests. Or I know you inherited that, yes. Well, it'll have a direct impact on another um, region. So, um, uh, uh, obviously, um, and it would be a dramatic change. So, it does warrant conversation. And Re that's kind of the, what this is, is, you know, to some degree, you all don't even have to talk to me. You can talk with each other uh, about things, about, you know, it would be better if I gave this up or if I didn't have to give that up. Re Regent Kelly, if I may, uh, Mr. Counselor, if I may jump in. Sure. Please. What, to our best, uh, under, uh, understanding is that it's been at least 20 years that the districts have been this way yeah. so the last ten, 10 years ago we did review them um, but no changes were made and so then that means that at least 10 years before that would be the, the the earliest that there was any changes and could very well be so just just for a little historical perspective I, I, I don't want my comments to be construed as an indictment of anybody um, I understand that this is the way it's been but when I look at the criteria that we're supposed to be using I'm wondering how these two districts are uh, school districts are divided into two different regents districts because um, maybe more than any any population area in the city they're isolated by themselves um, and separate from uh, the other population centers. Duly noted, understood, and that's what this is all about, so I appreciate okay. that very much. And, right. and I'll just say, along those lines, the one thing we have to respect is that there are districts that are very similar to each other, and that's the district that we All the other criteria are exceptions, and sometimes they need to be so, because uh, one criteria to apply to other regions is not going to be the same thing. So that's where the policy level is different. Um, what what parts of it are we gonna, you know, we're gonna sublimate this idea in order to focus on this idea. And that's what you guys have to do. And so it's good that you raise that point. It's top of mind now and, you know, the board can react to that. So let's, let's before we move on to another topic, let's explore that a little bit, I think, amongst the board. Uh, on face value, I certainly see that. And I think there's a, a great deal of validity for constituents and for our voters to look at that and say, well, how are Telosa Midway and Cal Allen separated? Why aren't they uh, represented by the same by the same regent? 
certainly we want to hear Mr. Garza's uh, feedback on, on that point as well. But I think that, I think on face value, I agree with you. But well, you look, um, then I, District 3 wraps around District 1 and takes in West Oso ISD. And if you are talking about common political interests, Pelosa Midway and Cal Allen um, uh, certainly have much more closely aligned political interests than Cal Allen and West Oso. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know how this district was drawn in the first place, um, but given the criteria that we were given, I don't understand how it's drawn that way. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Garza, do you have any feedback? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I just, uh, I don't know exactly what the intent was, and I, I can look at uh, Regent Kelly's perspective in terms of keeping those two communities together because there's some, so many similarities. I wouldn't see any issue in District 1 going into the area that is around the airport and in, in West Oso. The only concern, and I, I was even before uh, the gentleman uh, mentioned the deviation, it w I, I think the change would be so great that we wouldn't be able to keep it under the 10 percent deviation that it would take. So I think it would have to be right. something that would have to have to happen gradually. I would just we would to absolutely have to, have to see what the numbers played out like. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to give up a portion of I'm going to say District Three. You would have to give up a portion of what is considered the heart of the west side and then um, and then in order to be able to take a, a proportion of Telosa but I would think that I mean Telosa Midway but I would think that again I don't think that you could make go back to the way it was probably probably previously mm -hmm. and stay within the, the guidelines of the of the 10 percent well Go ahead right. and, and use your mics, and yeah, let's try to limit the <laughs> off mic comments. Yeah. yeah. So, but we would need another map to show the uh, numbers because Well, what, what Cameron has done in my office is put up the, the blue is now the school district boundaries, and it's got the names of the school districts in there. Yeah, exactly. So, we could actually, you know, or we could actually start with plan B because it, it sort of already does this a little bit and work off of that. and we can either do it here live and kind of click on some things and see what you think, or we can go back, you know, and do it in Austin and come back to your next meeting and, and show you, you know, okay, we, we were able to get Toulouse Midway and Cal Allen all in District 3. Correspondingly, 3 has now shrunk back out of, as they were saying, you know, kind of the west side of town. It might be helpful to see it in real time. Sure. Uh, just some real rough numbers like, wow, it would change half the district or something, I, because I think the impact on the amount of change at one time is also consideration. So I guess we could potentially, if, if we in theory Sorry. like the idea of trying to keep the school district boundaries together, can we start maybe with plan B? Sure. I think that, could, that might be an easier way, if, if, if we are all in agreement that we like that in concept. We need to see the the detail, but can we, I guess, move on to plan B? We can always go back. We're going to go back. We're going to do this a lot, aren't we, Mr. Caputo? As much as y'all want. I am <laughs> at your disposal, and Cameron cleared his morning, so. Because he's actually the most important one. He's pulling up the uh, plan B now, so we'll work off of that. Mr. Bennett, as we go through this, I'm going to trust that if you want to interject that you will grab my attention verbally or otherwise. <laughs> I, I will, thank you. Thank you, sir. So looking at this map, it appears as though there's a big area of Toulouse Midway that's in one, it's kind of the west side of, northwest side of one. And I don't know how many census blocks that is. Can you uh, go into that a little bit there, Cameron, and see what we're what we're going to be dealing sure with? Thing. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it looks like you split up three precincts. See, that's part of the issue right there is that one census block um, extends over across the water, which I think is okay. And there would be very little voting pop very low population in that. Right. There might be still a few homes that 
or liverworts. And there's always this little cleanup action that he has to do. <laughs> you can kind of see the oddity of the census blocks. Just a street there. So up in the left-hand corner, as you're looking at the screen, that table up there is showing you how many people are in the block that he's just highlighted. So there's 12,000, almost 13,000 people in there. So if you drop that into three, we'll be way out of balance, but we can start m moving some other things around. Well, I noticed that you've got kind of like a, a tongue or a, a hammer off the um, top of three um, digging into one, 75, 83, 43. Yeah. yeah. That, that kind of looks gerrymandered. <laughs> Gerrymandering is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> generally. The more you're using, you know, geographic and geopolitical boundaries, the less gerrymandered things are. Except to the extent that school district boundary lines and mm -hmm. county boundary lines in Texas at times appear fairly arbitrary. Okay, well as you can see, we made one much too big. I mean one's what much too small. And three's much too big. So is there any uh, preference to what goes from three back into one? He's starting with that hammer there. What if you move 75, 83, and 43 into one? Mr. Kelly, so we can follow along with you. You're looking at- I'm um, on plan B, district three map gotcha. with- Okay. And um, you can page three. Page page three. three. And you can see precinct 75, 83, 43 on the map. That's kind of the, um, uh, it looks like a, a head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that, that piece right there is kind of in the heart of it. That helps out a bit. We're still at a 20% deviation. Well, if we move the next few precincts over, what is that, 74? Um, 97, 73, say. Okay. And District one becomes very concentrated. That's what I was doing too. Is I mean, you're going to be pushing a lot of minority population to get in there. What does that do to? It's fine for me, but I mean, it's, what, what does that do in terms of giving minorities an opportunity to possibly win some seats at a later time? The other question mark I have, and I haven't seen any indication that we we put any preference or any kind of importance on, um, I'm going to say, contribution to the district in terms of um, valuations and taking some valuations from those areas that might be a little bit more affluent, like Peloso, and, and giving them to three and taking and putting areas into District 1 that that are the poorest areas in town. 
So I think you're going to find that um, the Northwest is um, not uh, a wealthy enclave. A lot of people think it is. You know, I'm s the District 3 would still be 74% minority. But you've got some pockets in District yeah, 3 and, and, and the Northwest side that are a lot There are more some nice neighborhoods, I agree. Then all the districts or the precincts that you're looking to put, to put into District 1. And again, I'm, it doesn't, for me personally, it didn't make a difference. I'm just hoping that at some point some regions won't. Because I've heard the conversation from constituents when I was in District 5 on the city council that we contribute so much more in terms of valuation, so therefore we, were we, sh we should receive more uh, s you know, improvements in terms of streets because, again, we pay more taxes, so we should have better streets. Yeah, and that's... Well, that's in the years that I represented District 1, that, that argument was not made. No, I know. <laughs> and it wasn't made on the council either. Yeah. It was just stuff that I had to hear or put up right. with in the community. So can we look at the overlay, go uh, zoom back out and look at the overlay of West Oso School District? Because um, in, in this iteration, we've got Cal Allen School District, Telosa Midway, and most of West Oso in District 3. Yeah, can you uh, scroll out a little bit? Right, Cameron, there you go. And can we focus on the school district boundaries, maybe take out the um, Oops, census block? There we go. So West Oso, it, the school district boundaries are in blue? Yes. Okay. So it looks like it's all in one now, except now. Yeah, it is. It is all in District 3 now. I mean, all in District 3, yeah. District 3 still has a piece of Corpus Christi ISD. Okay. That's interesting. I... I, I um, I think we ought to can look at that as a third alternative and just kind of keep that, keep that in there um, to continue to mull over. Yeah, I mean, it balances out constitutionally. Um, I, I'm a little, I kind of wish the minority population in three didn't go down quite that much, but it's compared to what it was, it's, but it's still plenty healthy. It's not, by no means you know, artificially reducing it. And what we could do is we could turn on the Hispanic thematic layer to see which areas have the highest Hispanic population and then end up moving those like back into three and shifting some around if we wanted to do that. Well, that's true, yeah. Uh, put that map up there just so they, they, they can be seen. There's a map that is a thematic map showing the concentration of uh, Hispanic population across the college district. Now, what it doesn't show you is the size of the of the concentration. And maybe this one does. I was thinking of the the one that shows it more in sort of shades of red across the district. I don't think we have that capability, unfortunately. Okay. So, Cameron, explain the the dots and the size of the dots so that we understand sort of the scale of what we're looking at. Sure thing. So the dots that are showing right uh, now are precincts that have, you can kind of play with the threshold right now, but I have it at, right now I have it set at precincts that are at least 80% uh, Hispanic. Mm. But you can shift that down to at least 50 or you can move it up to at least like 90 or something. Okay, good. Yeah, and then the size of the uh, blocks are just like how many people are in uh, each precinct. Yeah. So that's more of the density as opposed to the Exactly. Size. So now this is a, um, I guess, a plan C. Yes. Okay. We focused a lot on districts one and three um, in this version. Are there any other comments on one and three? I think we probably need to spend a little bit of time on two, four, and five to see if there's any comments there as we're moving around a little bit.
Cameron, yeah, can we, you're saving, I guess? Um, oh, uh, the plan auto saves, so I'm, I'll save it right now just in case, but um, yeah, and then I can move back on to whichever plan you would like. We'd like to, to look kind of uh, south and east to look at districts two, four, and five. All right, sure thing. And then right now I have, uh, this is plan B, and I can move, move back to plan A if you would like. But this is how it is with plan B. That's plan B with the changes we've just made, so. But the changes haven't affected two, four, or five so far. Right, exactly. So did your numbers change? Yes. Okay. So yeah. three is still 74% minority. Total minority and 67.69% Hispanic. Um, I'm looking more at the voting age population there, and it's still 65% Hispanic voting age population, which is very strong. Were there comments from Regents on districts two, four, and five? Is everybody comfortable with those districts as presented? Right, so you have all of Flower Bluff and a little bit of CCISD. Yeah, 126. 126, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, part of it is, yeah. yeah. Cameron, did we lose you? No, I'm here. Sorry, was there, uh, were you wanting to switch precincts? Cobb, you have to keep your mic on. I'm sorry, that one turns off. Yeah, so you I have know. to keep I'm on turning it back on. Um, I apologize. Scroll down on the map so that we can see the Flower Bluff boundaries, Flower Bluff School District boundaries. So isn't that, that purple block at the bottom, isn't that in Flower Bluff? Um, this, this area down here? Yes. Okay. Yes, so um, this area basically has zero population. It's just empty land. Oh. Um, and then the issue, we thought it, we initially tried to move it into uh, District 4, but there was an issue with there's kind of a block that's uh, kind of split between these two areas, so it wouldn't really be able to uh, do that thing, B. Let me show you real quick. This is one of those census block ge yeah. geometry so problems. Got, somehow part of the block got cut up over here, and then the other part got cut up down here, and you have to move them both at once. And the latest part of King Ranch and some of the rancher areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the other side, yeah. Right. There's, there's yeah, I'm just... There. Right, I'm just making it clear that it's not, it's not all of, it's a yeah. populated part of Flower Bluff. Yeah, ISD is all right. in District 4, but there's a little chunk of the district's territory that's not. And it's just because of that weird census thing. So, really that. So you're not kicking me out of my district? <laughs> no, and that's, the, there's a, there's a layer he can put on that shows where all of you live. Um, so that we, we do keep, we pay attention to that. Right. Because yeah. you're, you're kind of close to the edge, as I yes, recall. Yes, I am. I'm like right on the edge. <laughs> like, you're kicking me out. Yeah. Thank you. Now, y'all can tell me to kick you out. <laughs> I've, had, I've had jurisdictions where people say that. They're either term limited in city world, or they're not going to run again, or they're moving, and they're like, so I don't care. Just, you know, oh, no. redraw the boundary Maybe however you want. All okay. right. Well. So are we? Can I make one, one suggestion? I'm flipping back and forth between charts and maps sure, and, yeah. and keeping up here as best I can. One thing that would be helpful to me is as we narrow it down to plans is to be able to have a comparison, particularly I'm looking at the uh, minority populations. Yeah, so the that we say here's where, here's where we are today. 
uh, the districts are, here's plan A, here's plan B, plan C. Yes. Anyway. I can put that I think together. that's all in here, but it's. It is, but it's not yeah. in one table, and I, I, can, yeah. I can put it all into one table. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, very helpful. And you're right, it's always good to compare it to what we have today, because we don't want to deviate too much from the current mm -hmm. demographics of each district. Two has become a very compact district. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, if we are comfortable with where we are today, um, what would be, what are our next steps? Um, we will give you the same sort of maps and demographic data for this plan that we've given you for the other ones. And I'll do that table and I can either come back at a, another workshop or another meeting um, and y'all can discuss and decide if there's one of them that you prefer uh, we can make that the one that we then go to the public with. And Mr. Rivera, how does that fit into our time, time frame? Would we be able to do this one? I think it keeps us on track. Okay. Yeah. And would we be able to um, do that workshop uh, and state a preference in March and then do a public hearing and vote in April? Sure. Was that, was that our, our original plan? Right. Okay. That, was, that was a timetable that was laid out as kind of a, you know, theoretical approach. I think right. at, one, at one point we, all, we, we talked about trying to get it done by May. Right. Uh, and, and so now you're actually a little ahead of schedule. Okay. And of course, I know you all intend this and you want to provide as much opportunity for the public to weigh in as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And so by... by Again, I don't, I don't want to go to a point of narrowing in on a preference today. I think we need right. to see the comparison numbers and be able to sit with those um, yeah. uh, and come back for another workshop in March. Uh, okay. I think it would be very helpful. And at that point in time, we could have a possible action to state a preference. Again, it's not a final decision. It would be a, a board preference. Uh, and then let staff do their, their, um, their work on public notices and those kinds of things. And as Mr. Caputo mentioned, I mean, if there are thoughts that you have after this, I mean, again, it's, it's a continuous process. You don't have to wait until next March, I mean, until your next meeting to provide additional input for him to kind of work with. I think he welcomes that. Oh, yeah. Any and, feedback you all want to pass through, Augie, to me is. And the soon, you know, as soon as he can get some maps drawn up, um, we'll get them to you. So That'd be you, great. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I don't mean to rush the conversation today, but I also don't need to prolong it if everybody's comfortable with where we are today, because we do have another item on our workshop. All right, so for today, we are finished with this portion of the workshop. Mr. Caputo, thank you. Cameron, thank you. Cameron, the voice in the sky, thank you. <laughs> the guy with no the problem. map. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you all very much, and I'll see you. Uh, see you in a month. In a month. <laughs> Yeah, I'll see some of you in DC, maybe. That's right. That's right. Okay. Safe good. travels, Bye. Mr. Caputo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much for that. Um, I think we are benefiting from potentially Mr. Kelly's and no, Mr. Garza's uh, previous experience session. in <laughs> redistricting. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So we will move on to the second item on our workshop agenda, which is our annual college ethics update. Uh, we do this as uh, for our internal board policy uh, that asks us to remind ourselves on an annual basis of the board ethics work. Now we're, we're lucky in that the, um, the ad hoc committee uh, did a whole lot of work in this area over the last few months. And so we have been, um, been thinking about this topic for a while, but are uh, going to welcome our general counsel, Mr. Rivera, to provide our uh, ethics update and review. Uh, good morning, Regents. Um, it feels a little odd talking to you about ethics because that's all you did last year. For the three of you, at least, it was a, it was a nonstop uh, process, but in accordance with uh, your schedule and your commitment, here we go. I may go a little light on you, but uh, let's see how quickly I can get through some of these, through some of these slides. But as uh, Regent Scott mentioned, this is something you've been doing for almost 10 years now. Uh, 
from a prior board. Um, and I'm proud enough of it that I brag about it every chance I get publicly. So um, here's the little summary. And again, this is sort of for public consumption as well. We know that there are folks who are interested in what you do and who are paying attention to this. And I think it's important to keep them informed as well. As I mentioned, back in 2012, there was an ad hoc committee of the board that uh, took a look at the bylaws, specifically the Statement of Conduct and Ethics. That was an ad hoc committee chaired by Regent Hutchinson. And there were changes that were proposed uh, that were adopted by the board. It was after that that the board began to conduct an annual ethics review and update. After every uh, uh, update, uh, each of you or each of the regents would be asked to sign a code of ethics pledge committing to ethical conduct uh, for the rest of the year in conducting their, their in how they conducted themselves as, as, as regents. Uh, just a point, I mean, one of the things that we continue to do in, uh, is since 2015, we've pretty regularly presented on community college ethics. And you can see there, you know, at the state level as well as the national level, ACCT, AACC, uh, the TACA group, which is the community college attorneys group, uh, and uh, the coordinating board have all heard from Del Mar, either through Regents or uh, Dr. Escamilla or myself on the, on the topic of ethics and, and governance. Dr. George Boggs, uh, who some of you may know, I know Dr. Escamilla knows him really well. Uh, he's sort of a Dean Emeritus of, of community college governance. He's a uh, longtime college president, and, and, and he was also for, uh, for quite a while the president and CEO of the American Association of Community Colleges, AACC. He wrote a book called Ethical Leadership in the Community College, which I have on my desk. And some of you have seen this before, and I, and I think it bears you know, repeating. Dr. Boggs observes about the question of, of ethics that um, leadership in our society is a privilege that enables the leader to impact both organizations and the lives of people, but it also carries many responsibilities. Perhaps the most important responsibility for anyone who is in a position of influence is to honor the public trust. Community colleges, for all the good that they do for individuals, still exhibit the same type of lapses in ethics that we find throughout society. Why do these lapses continue to occur and what can be done to strengthen the ethical foundations of our institutions? So Dr. Boggs answers his own question uh, as follows. Restoring public confidence can only happen if we begin to make ethical behavior a significant value, a significant value, especially for leaders in our institutions and organizations. It is important to think seriously about ethical values before one is faced with difficult and ambiguous dilemmas that are all too common. One of my favorite movies of all time is Spy Game. It's got Robert Redford, and if you've never seen it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and even though it's like almost 20 years old, it's still pretty cool. And at one point, uh, his assistant asks him, you're a little nervous? Uh, and, and it's a complicated story, and I'm not going to do any spoiler alerts, but he turns and he says, Gladys, when did, Noah, when did uh, Noah build the ark? And he says, before the rain, before the rain. So the whole point of, of, of being prepared for ethical dilemmas when they come up is you've got you've to build the ark before the rain. And that's what Dr. Boggs is talking about there. Ethics statements do not guarantee ethical behavior. If it were easy enough to just write it down, then we wouldn't ha ever have any problems. We all know that's not how things work in, in the real world. But still, ethical statements serve to remind leaders that ethical consideration should guide their behavior. And that's what you're doing every year formally now as part of your bylaws. You're reminding yourselves of what it means to be ethical. Best practices for better ethics. This is a list that, that we've developed, that I've developed uh, from, from uh, different presentations, from getting feedback from colleagues of yours from all around the country, from looking at what ACCD, ACCT puts out there. And it's what, what I regularly promote when, when speaking to trustees and, and regents about best practices. Uh, and you all follow these. Uh, I, I think I've told you all before, I, I like to start out these presentations at times, especially when it's a packed room of regents or trustees, and, and I'll ask them, how many, you know, how many of you have a statement of conduct or, or ethics? And you'll see some people raise hands. You know, when's the last time you looked at those? And, and it's always interesting to see the blank faces that you get. I mean. Believe it or not, people don't, don't do what you do. I mean, I'm not asking you to pat yourselves on the back, but I'm pointing out to you that 
that's where the problems occur. And, and that, that to me is the most telling part of the presentation is always how many people don't know where to even look, you know. And um, um, Regent Scott was at the uh, coordinating board conference back in December and I was on a panel uh, you know, speaking about governance and the duties that you all have as trustees together with two other uh, university attorneys. And, and afterwards, um, a, a, a trustee from the Houston Community College wanted to talk to me about our bylaws and, and, and asked for a copy. And I said, well, funny that you ask because you know, we just went through a rewrite. And so, so your good work is being you know, spread, spread around. Um, you, know, you see the others, you, you need to include in the bylaws a formal process for addressing unethical conduct by a board member and the action that a board is authorized to take in such a situation. Um, believe it or not, before I was here, uh, some time ago, uh, th there was a problem with that that ended up in a legal matter involving the Del Mar board uh, because there wasn't a written process on how to, how to, you know, how to respond uh, or, or you know, now you have a censure, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that at the end of the presentation um, in, in light of what's going on right now before the US Supreme Court in the Houston Community College versus Wilson case. But um, that's actually something that's pretty important. And Dr. Wilson is here, and she'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that SAC COC actually requires you to have, you know, as part of their accreditation process, you as a board need to have not only bylaws, but you have to have some way to, re to, to regulate each other. Um, review board bylaws and college policy on a regular basis, ensure that everybody's provided with a new member orientation, uh, covering a variety of topics, conduct a regular board ethics update, uh, address ethical violations swiftly and decisively. This board has a history of doing that uh, to its credit. And then conduct annual or regular evaluations of the college president and yourselves. And happy to say you do all of these. ACCT talks about uh, ethical governance as, you know, functioning best when the ethical standards for trustee behavior are clear. Okay, they have to be clear. And I can assure you that the, the three members of the ad hoc committee that reviewed everything last year were looking at that very carefully. You all were very, very, you know, very intent on making sure that language was clear. Um, so you'll see some regional community college accrediting commissions already require that boards have a code of ethics or similar statement in place. SAC COC does, you do, you're okay there. In 2021, uh, you know, again, an ad hoc committee of the board reviewed the board bylaws and statement of conduct and ethics and proposed changes that you all adopted last fall. Uh, chaired by Regent Averett and included Regents Hutch Hutchison and Turner. Uh, the work was extensive, as you know, and it, it really was a deep dive into best practices that uh, resulted in a number of improvements. And I've, I've, I'd like to say innovations to your ethics rules. Uh, that serve and also serve as a reaffirmation of your commitment to ethical conduct. So let's begin with this. I wanted to highlight, I'm not gonna go through the entire uh, set of bylaws. Those were provided to you. Those were in your packet. You had an opportunity to review them. I'm gonna focus on the statement of conduct and ethics and just kind of walk you through those uh, as, as a refresher of where you, where you are today and give you the opportunity to ask questions if you want. Uh, I mean, this isn't a one-way street. Uh, I'm just facilitating this, but uh, but I wanted to start off with the with the preamble or the or the, the ethical statement at, at at the front end. You all will remember that your your ad hoc committee members um, really put some time and effort into thinking about what to say at the very front end, and and I think I think it really it 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 tells you're telling each other uh, on the board what you think ethics are, and you're telling the rest of the Del Mar community. And, and, and frankly, the, the, the public, you know, writ large, at large, uh, how you all see ethics. And I'll just read it. The following bylaws of the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District provide the operational framework within which the board shall govern and act, as well as the aspirational and legal standards by which each board member shall conduct themselves in the performance of their duties and in representing Del Mar College. Um, importantly, these bylaws include expectations of ethical behavior that are more than what is required by law. The Board of Regents acknowledges the profound importance of leading by example and with these bylaws endeavors to cultivate a culture of exemplary ethics at Del Mar College. I frankly think that it's, 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 it's bold to say, uh, to admit up front, that you're asking each other to do more than what the law requires. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't see that in, in, in very many of the you know, 
ethical codes that you all reviewed, but uh, you have it in yours. Um, the order of the sections, just to give you an overview, like I say, we're not gonna go through them, we're gonna focus on section two, but here's how you have it lined out. You've got board duties and responsibilities, uh, statement of conduct and ethics. You specifically cover uh, email uh, as, and, and official communications. Social media, I think three and four are, are more than anything indicative of the fact that you're keeping up with the times, uh, you know, in, 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 in covering those issues. Five has the conflicts of interest, which I think you should always go to first. And then of course you have questions, you can always call me. Uh, six is the regent misconduct uh, part. The, the committee fleshed that out a little bit more and provided a, a little bit more process. Um, hopefully you won't ever have to test drive that. I mean, the version you had before worked fine. You had to drive it actually a few times but uh, you haven't had to in a while. I hope that's one that we keep on the shelf. But there it is, and, and, and uh, seven, board elections and appointments. Eight, board member training. Nine, covers the officers. 10, you cover your committees of the board. 11, uh, 12, 13, and 14 all have to do with what you do on a, on, a, on a monthly basis. Your meetings, what your order of business is typically gonna be you know, provision for a public comment. You all, again, thought it was very important to spell out in your bylaws how important you considered public comment and, and, and the guidelines for how to present public comment. And then your rules of order. Minutes of proceedings, rules of decorum, and amendment of bylaws are just, the, you know, the, 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 they wrap it up. So it's all there. Like I said, it was presented to you in your board packet for review. You should have a copy I would say at your desk or you know not by your nightstand or maybe your nightstand when you're, you can't sleep uh, but it's something that I know you all are very familiar with because you went through it in such detail last year so you're probably this is really more than a refresher I mean it, it's it's it should be very familiar to you given that you just went through all of this in detail so let's go over the statement of conduct and ethics just to make sure that we're all on the same page there um, you all expect each other to, you know, to, to conduct yourselves at all times in accordance with the highest ethical principles and shall strive to support the mission and vision statements of the college and shall adhere to the following standards. Attend and participate actively in board meetings. Um, devote time, thought, and study to the duties of a board member in order to render effective and informed <coughs> service. Work with other board members to establish effective board policies, delegate authority for the administration of the college to the president and CEO of the college, and act on behalf of the board only with the official authorization of a majority of the members of the board. Make policy decisions only after full discussion at publicly held board meetings. Base all decisions on the available facts and independent judgment, free from any undue or improper influence and abide by and uphold the final majority decision of the board. Um, avoid during a pending bidding, solicitation, selection, or appointment process any communications with involved vendors, contractors, bidders, or applicants outside of the board established process. The board chair or other designee will provide information or answer questions from the public about the process. So this one you're gonna do sort of on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you know, different, different situations may call for different processes, but you'll be able to figure that out. But I remember the committee thought it very important to at least establish this as a ground rule to give everybody guidance about what you, what you shouldn't do. Um, and, and also as a way to tell the public, this is, this, is, this is what our rule is, this is what we're living by, and so uh, please respect that. <clears throat> Recognize that the college adheres to the concept of free speech and academic freedom, encourages the free expression of opinion by all board members, and seeks systematic communications between the board and students, faculty, staff, and the community while refraining from communicating with students, staff, faculty, and the community in any way which could be imper interpreted as having any authority outside the meetings of the board and, for, and refraining from any communications among a quorum of board members outside of the board meeting. So that last part, refraining from any communications, obviously you can't do that because that would be violating the Open Meetings Act if you were all talking outside a board meeting in a quorum. But we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up in, in just a little bit, a few minutes with, uh, with the Houston Community College case and, and, and the free speech issue that's been presented there. 
but um, you know, I think this is again a, a strong statement of, of, of you all recognizing in your ethical conduct that uh, you want to you, you want to give people free speech, but you need to be careful. You also understand that each of you individually, in respecting somebody's free speech, could get unnecessarily entangled in a matter that's pending in an administrative level, a complaint or you know something or, or a lawsuit, and you've got to be careful with that. Uh, this is something that I know each of you take seriously, uh, and you do communicate, um, to, you know, to Regent Scott or to or, or to Dr. Scamia, expressions of public reaction to board policies and college programs. You get something from the community, you, you know. I know Dr. Scamia, you know, you know his number. You've got him on speed dial. You're going to let him know, or Regent Scott, just depending on which, or both. <coughs> Work with other board members and with the president and CEO in a spirit of harmony and cooperation and in a manner that creates and sustains mutual respect. In many ways, that's probably from what I've seen from my, in my humble opinion, from my vantage point as serving as general counsel of the college now for 15 plus years, that's actually hard to do. Um, but you all managed to do that. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been in a, in a round table discussion with other regents or trustees from other colleges, and it's not like that. I mean, they're, they're, they're divided, there's a lot of rancor, and it's unfortunate, because you got, you got to ask yourself, what are you doing here? <laughs> I mean, really, if, if you're not going to be willing to sit down and listen, like for example, this morning was a perfect, it's just a perfect example of how you all work together. Uh, you're presented with an issue that in many quarters, or in, in other, in, in, before other bodies, is, it can be very contentious, and, and, and you got, you know, a very wise, insightful, you know, uh, a, a point of view, and the rest of you kind of took it and looked at it and worked with it, and, and you're not done yet, but, 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 you know, again, that's the way things should work. Um, but it's not always like that, and I'm sure you all know that as well. Uh, become informed about current educational issues by studying and participating in programs such as those sponsored by, you all do that. Support the employment of those persons best qualified to serve as co college faculty and staff. Insist on a regular and partial evaluation of all faculty and staff and respect the authority and responsibilities of college employees and external contractors to empower them to work without interference. Now the fact that you all have this in here, that, you're that, you, that you should insist on a regular and impartial evaluation of all faculty and staff, doesn't mean that you conduct a regular and impartial evaluation of faculty. That's for Dr. Escamilla to oversee. But you need to, you should be, and he does, he reassures you on a regular basis of what he's doing with employees and how that's going along and, and you know that there's a plan in place every year to evaluate. So that, that's what that means. Remember always that the first and greatest priority must be the educational welfare of the students attending the college. Avoid real or apparent conflicts of interest and refrain from engaging in any activity that could create a conflict of interest. Refrain from using the board position for personal or partisan gain. Now, you should never be using your position to try to get something from someone that you're not entitled to or that, that's inappropriate. I, I can't even think of a situation like that. But it doesn't mean that uh, you, you can't promote or let the public know that you're a Delmar, you know, Delmar region. I think that's, that's factual, that's true. In fact, you ought to put down that as, a, you, you should be looking at that as a credential. As your of your commitment to public service, I mean, it's okay to say I'm a Delmar College Regent, you know, for whatever purpose. What you can't do is tell somebody I'm a Delmar College Regent, so you need to do this favor for me. <laughs> That's where you're, you, do, you know, using it for personal gain. Uh, bring about desired changes through legal and ethical procedures, upholding and enforcing all applicable statutes, regulations, and court decisions pertaining to community colleges. Work with other board members to establish effective policies and practices that prohibit all forms of unlawful discrimination, including harassment on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, including pregnancy, gender identity and or expression, sexual orientation, age, disability, and or veteran or military status. Refrain from any attempt, refrain from any attempt to influence any operational decision, including but not limited to individual admissions, personnel, or purchasing decisions, except when such is a legitimate issue at a board meeting. And no board member shall have any communications about a grievance or complaint with any person with a pending grievance or complaint. Couldn't be more clear than that. Identify and disclose any actual or potential conflict of interest and act for the general public good, regardless of personal relationships or business interests. 
refrain from suggesting or recommending subcontractors to vendors at any time. I know that sounds very specific, uh, you know, but believe me, uh, the, the, the ad hoc committee thought about this, deliberated it ex extensively, and so there is a purpose to it, and I think it, it is a good one. That's why it's in there. Encourage and engage in open and honest discussion in making board decisions, respect differences of opinion, and keep an open mind until each region has had an opportunity to address the board. Refrain from accepting or soliciting any gift, favor, or service that might influence or appear to influence a region in the performance of official duties. And again, it, that's, that's where you're going with the aspirational. You really hope that each of you, whenever you're presented with a situation where even if it's legitimate to accept a gift, you know, how is this going to look? Let me think hard about that. And that's, that's, that's what was intended there. Maintain the strict confidentiality of information presented, discussed, or deliberated during any closed board meeting or during any closed board committee meeting, proprietary of the college or that's about the college, not within the public domain. As fiduciaries of the college, any region's disclosure or misuse of information may be considered official misconduct or abuse of office as defined by law. Endeavor to avoid for a period of one year after leaving office both the possibility of a com conflict of interest and the appearance of such conflict that would arise if the former regent takes employment or enters into a business relationship with any vendor, contractor, company, or other individual or entity in a business relationship with the college. I'm not going to go over this again. You all went over it in great detail. You had a lot of discussion about this. This was reworked a couple of times by the committee uh, based on input that you provided. Um, it, it, there's no way you can enforce this. You know that. That's why it says endeavor to. But again, the idea is let's say it and let's put it out there as something that we would all like to live up to. And, you know, the, you've done the best that you can. Conduct with the assistance of the college's general counsel an annual ethics update that will specifically include a review of the board's bylaws and statement of conduct and ethics. That's what we're doing now. And after which you will prepare and file a personal disclosure statement and a commitment to ethical conduct. Those forms were included um, with, your, with your packet. And again, it's sort of repetitious, but it, it's okay because you line it out again. It also covers what happens when somebody comes onto the board uh, in midstream, uh, you all thought it was important enough to have them go through this very same update within 90 days of coming on the board. And so if they come on on March, if they, you were to appoint somebody in March, you'd want them to do it within 90 days instead of having to wait a whole entire new year. So, Just a couple of, first of all, any questions about any of that? Like I said, you all are the experts on this. You, you've gone You've done this. You've done this work, and so I hope this was just a refresher of familiar things to you that you've already done. But I want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions about any of the. Mr. Rivera, do you part. have the statement of ethical conduct and the disclosure statement in printed form for us today, or can I? I can get it. Okay. I don't have one, but I, we can certainly bring it up. Yeah. While y'all leave, I don't, lunch. I don't think any of us printed it out to okay. bring it with us, so that would be helpful. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. And then, uh, lastly, I'm, I was. Uh, on board effect today trying to get stuff to load up on my iPad and I noticed that our most recent um, bylaws are not on board effect. I okay. realize they're on the college's website and that there's some work being done there but I think it would be helpful if those were loaded on board effect uh, so that the, it's easily accessible to, to us there as well. We'll do. That's oversight on my part. I forget how much you all use that but that's, that's a, we'll do that. Other comments or questions for Mr. Rivera before he moves on? Dr. Cameron? I just wanted to say being a part of the committee, we work really hard to ensure integrity and in putting standards for the college and the members, and we really believe in transparency, and I just hope that, you know, that we did a good job and we we're diligent to the, the staff, members, and the community as we went through this process, and it was great working with everyone. You did a really fine job, and we really, you know, we appreciate everyone, staff, everybody, to helping with the ethics updates and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turner and Regent Hutchison and Regent Averett. We just brought we just brought you the stuff and then you, you all hashed it out and, and then board thank you because then you took what they did and looked at it and you, you all took it very seriously and I, I I'm honing in on your key words, integrity and transparency. And so to the extent that anyone feels like, well why do we say this again? It's we've already said it once, it's because it bears repeating. It, that's why it's that important 
Uh, and so thank you for your work. And um, uh, just a couple of more things for those of you that, that have seen me present before, I, I usually start off with a headlines slide where I say, you know, fire ethics important and I have all these scary headlines, you know. Community college trustee led, led off in handcuffs, you know, for bribery. I mean, sir. Point out someplace else. Yeah, yeah <laughs> not here, not far away, never here. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, those are the kinds of things that scare you, right? I mean, because it could happen anywhere. You know, nobody's immune from, from issues or problems. And we're going to finish up with something in a second, you know, the HCC case. But um, I, I couldn't help myself. I had to leave you with one headline. Okay, and college trustees knock for ethics violations decry unfair system. This is from 2020. It's a community college in California. If you Google that, you will see the article. But, um, you know, there were, there were ethics complaints that the board had to file against two of their trustees. And for bullying, for harassing, you know, late night calls. I mean, it was sorted. I mean, it was just the, the kind of drama that, that you, you really don't want to be known as that kind of a board. Uh, people were being petty with each other, you know, threatening each other, and this is at the board level. So full drama gets played out in public, you know, public, lots of publicity, and it's in the newspaper and the news. It's the risk of reputational damage. So I'm not suggesting that you do it for, for um, you know, for that purpose alone. But certainly, when, 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 you're, when you're trying to figure out ethical questions, you should always keep in mind, how will this look out in the public, the transparency part? And the risk of reputational damage is a real thing. It's what our risk management talks about. It, it, and it can just torpedo an entire board. If the public doesn't have confidence in each one of you and in you collectively as a board, then they don't have confidence in Belmar College. It's that simple. And regents and trustees that don't get that you know, shouldn't be in office, in my humble opinion. So off my soapbox, but that's, that's what it's about. And so that's why I'm so happy to, uh, and, and just proud to be able to brag about you all because um, there was a time when it wasn't like that. It was, it was it just, and I'm not suggesting that it was even in recent history because there have been a lot of, um, you know, you all know, there have been, there've been a number of amazing people, dedicated public servants who sat in the, your chairs that were committed to Del Mar College. And um, you know, that's what that's what you should always be thinking about whenever whatever decisions or actions are taken. All right, I'm going to end with uh, so the Houston Community College case, which uh, you know the, it, it, it's had a, 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 a an incredible history, legal history. It's actually pending before the U.S. Supreme Court. It has to do with a trustee uh, that um, again was was a little contentious. Uh, you know, sued the board, sued other board members. Uh, this was several years ago, and it, it got to the point where the board uh, voted to censure the board member. Now, let's be very, very clear about the definition of the word censure. Censure, as opposed to censor, uh, you know, censure means that the, the board takes a collective vote and they, they, they disapprove, thumbs down, of the actions taken by a trustee. Now in this case, they actually went further, and they, you know, they said they banned them from being able to run for, for, for an officer position. They took away the trustees' travel, you know, uh, tra travel uh, budget. Uh, I mean, it was that bad, and I'm not going to get into all the details of, of what the regent did. But so the censure happens, and then um, the trustee files suit, alleging that his First Amendment rights to um, you know, to free speech, his First Amendment right to free speech was restricted or unfair, you know, illegally infringed upon by the vote of censure. So you can see that, that that's the question that's before the United States Supreme Court. And I listened to the oral argument uh, last November, 90 minutes of back and forth. Uh, and I can tell you, I mean, and this is what most of the legal commentators that, that, that are watching the case also said, that it looks like at the end of the day, the court's going to find some way to uphold a board's ability to censure a one of their own. 
you know, you didn't, you didn't make up centuries. Community colleges didn't make up centuries. I mean, it, it, it's a time honored. It's been around for generations. It comes from parliamentary procedure. You know, there's a history that goes all the way, tradition that goes all the way back to England. I mean, it, it, it's been around for hundreds of years. And you, 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 you should have some ability to express disapproval. You can't remove each other. We've gone over that before. You know, your elected officials and the Texas Election Code, and that's in your bylaws, you know, addresses that. But uh, this ability to censure, um, it, it's just interesting that it's being challenged at this point. And so we're all waiting because what I've just told you is nothing but an opinion. I mean, you know, you, you know in, 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 in the opinions of a few others that I've seen that are smarter than I am about Supreme Court jurisprudence, they could come up with anything. But, <clears throat> but the fact that um, it's interesting because the trustee himself admits that the board should have some ability to regulate or, or make some comment about the actions of other trustees. He just didn't like the word censure. He said it injured his reputation. So uh, yeah, so, so you know, uh, uh, anyways, an interesting oral argument and I just wanted to present it to you as kind of a, a, a closing shot. Regent Averett mentioned it during the bylaws work that there was this pending case and that you know, it could change the way you look at stuff. But um, it's an interesting case and you can bet that I'll let you know as soon as we get a decision. I wanted to leave you with uh, a quote some of you have seen before. This actually goes back to 1996. Professor Stephen Carter, who teaches at the Yale Law School and is quite a prolific author and, and got tired of writing about things like integrity and, uh, and values and he switched over to fiction. Anyways, he's a He's a super bright guy. But this is one of my favorite quotes, and, and I'm gonna leave you with this. Um, he wrote a book called Integrity, and again, this was back in the 90s, uh, and he came at it from a legal perspective, but I lifted this quote, and I've been able to use it time and again. The lack of time is an unfortunate characteristic of today's Americans, and volumes have been written about how it is hurting our children and our families but it is hurting our morality just as much. For if we decide that we do not have time to stop and think about right and wrong, then we do not have time to live according to our models of right and wrong, which means simply put that we do not have time for lives with integrity. The point is to remain ethical, to, 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 to always try to do the right thing always, you gotta put some time into it. You all did that last year, you've done it again today, and I appreciate it very much. That's all I have, I hope that's, uh, we'll get you the copies of the, of the forms for you all to sign. Any questions? Comments or questions for Mr. Ribeiro? Thank you very much. Thank we you appreciate all. appreciate this. Thank you all. Board members, we will not have closed session during our workshop agenda, and we will cover calendaring in our regular agenda. Uh, at this point, we will um, adjourn our workshop meeting and we will reconvene at 1 p.m. for our regular uh, full agenda. Uh, the time is 12, 18 p.m. We are adjourned. <laughs>